to England in May for some Northern Hemisphere spring birding. It's cold but sunny, and in the heart of London there are plenty of birds. We thought we'd left the land of parrots, but ring-necked parakeets are now very well established in London and have become the most northerly breeding parrot in the world. These plump pigeons are one of the most common woodland birds. Jackdaws, the smallest of the crows, inquisitive, intelligent birds like most corvids. The adaptable, opportunistic magpie is also very common. As is the carrion crow, which shares its characteristics. Probably the UK's favourite bird, the robin, is found in woods, parks and gardens where there is shrubby vegetation. This far south, grey lag geese probably derive from human introductions, although the Icelandic population overwinters in the far north of Scotland. What elegant breeding plumage. Almost any well vegetated body of fresh water holds a population of moorhen, the most common of the British crakes and rails. But this spectacular mandarin duck took us by surprise. It looks incongruously flamboyant on the banks of the serpentine. Egyptian goose, cosmopolitan London indeed. A familiar duck for Australians. The ubiquitous Canada goose. Tufted ducks give us beautiful views, especially the handsome male in breeding plumage. The next day we meet our guide from Nature Trek, Toby Collette, and head northeast to Minsmere in Suffolk, one of the longest established and best bird reserves in Britain. 1,000 hectares of carefully managed diverse habitats. The charming village of Wesselton is a handy base with proximity to Minsmere and Wesselton Heath. By evening, we're at Minsmere and observing a tiny inconspicuous tree creeper spiraling jerkily up the trunk of a large tree in search of insects and spiders. In contrast, chaffinches are conspicuous, common and cheerily loud. Wow, that sounds promising. Maybe a good start to the day. Parts of Minsmere are managed with the aim of restoring the threatened UK bittern population. The hides are beautifully set up to maximise viewing opportunity. Swaying about on a reed is a male reed bunting in striking breeding plumage. We can hear that boom boom again and the reeds are rustling. Clearing and the bittern flies across, giving thrilling views of this large endangered bird. Wandering through the woodland, we can hear one of the many warblers, the nondescript but impressively tuneful garden warbler. Another of the inconspicuous warblers, the chiff-chaff, is often heard but very chif difficult to see chif -chif. in thick spring foliage. A shy woodland wanderer, Muntjac deer. We're trying a different hide for a chance at Marsh Harrier, which has been successfully reintroduced here. Whoops, just went down. We'll try the feeders for small passerines. Good views of marsh tit, almost identical to willow tit, but a little more common. And we have Toby with us, or we'd never know the difference. Here's the robin again. Picking up scraps from the feeder is the sparrow-like dunnock, an unobtrusive ground feeder, often called a hedge sparrow. Commonest of the tits, blue tit, which lays up to 16 eggs at a time, and great tit, the biggest and boldest of the family. A male pheasant, 
An introduced bird bred in captivity, then loosed for hunting. Wren, a tiny bird with an incredibly loud song, which pinpoints it in the dense understory it favours. Out of the woodland and into bearer habitat, we've spotted a woodlark. No, two. Extremely difficult to see as they're so camouflaged on the bare ground that has been specially created to provide perfect habitat for this threatened species. Red-legged partridge, an introduced game bird. And behind it, field fare, a wintering thrush which we're lucky to see this late in spring. Concentrating to see a distant bird, stone curlew, on its preferred bare stony ground, another recovery success. Lesser white throat, maybe just arrived from Africa. Amazing Minsmere, bounded by a nuclear power plant and the sea, but with such an abundance of habitats and species. The wind's horrendous now, but it can't drown the lovely song of the linnet. A species which likes coastal areas, male stone chat. And the irrepressible chaffinch. Yet another habitat, a vertical sand wall with breeding sand martens. They've just arrived from Africa and tunneled up to a metre into these walls to nest. Now into another hide, one of five overlooking the scrape, an area designed to replicate a natural saline lagoon. Water and salinity levels are carefully controlled to provide optimum habitat for both breeding and migrant birds. Regular management provides ideal conditions for the various freshwater aquatic and soil invertebrates that form the basis of the food chain and the results can be seen with the abundance of species making use of this area. The black-headed gold chick is almost as big as the avocet. Next morning, we can't resist another chance for the bittern. On the way into the hide, we enjoy an even closer view of reed bunting. There are some lovely water birds to entertain us while we wait for the star. We've been told it's nesting to the left of the hide, so we're concentrating on that area. Suddenly, it flies up out of the reeds and gives glorious flight views. Wow! After dropping to only one booming male in the 1990s, careful water level management has led to around a dozen males being present annually, and the application of techniques pired at Minsmere has led to a national revival of this species. The beautiful expanse of Wesselton Heath is close to Minsmere and we're looking for the rare Dartford warbler, one of Britain's resident warblers. No, similar colours but another stone chat. This is it, Dartford warbler, found only in the south of England. Its numbers can crash during a harsh English winter. Next morning, it's a beautiful sunny spring day and we're leaving the Wesselton district and heading north to the Pennines. On the way, we'll call into Frampton Marsh on the Lincolnshire shore of the Wash, which is the UK's most important estuary for wildlife. This bird reserve is being developed with varied and dynamic habitats as it's a crucial place for both migrating and breeding waders. And as a bonus, our guide Toby is warden here. A welcoming visitor centre with great viewing facilities. First, we get onto a duck we haven't seen before, Potchard, the male with rufous head. The finches are at the feeders as usual, and we can enjoy unobstructed close views. 
And here's another new duck for us, Shoveler, with its capacious flattened bill adapted for filter feeding. This reserve is being managed to offer close views of the birds with minimal disturbance. In spring, this salt marsh makes ideal nesting habitat for lapwing. A much smaller plover, ringed plover, is busily feeding while the elegant avocet nests nearby. The emblem of the RSPB, the avocet represents the achievement of bringing a bird from extinction in the UK to a locally common breeder on bird reserves. The red shank is easily recognised by its red legs, another salt marsh breeder. Wow, an incredibly close view of nesting great crested grebe compared to our usual views far out in deep water. We've reached the eastern wall of Frampton Marsh. It's a great vantage point to see waders like this godwit. On the other side of the extensive marsh is the estuary leading into the North Sea. Cattle are grazing here and also the dark-bellied form of Brent's goose, the smallest goose, still not departed to their breeding grounds in Arctic Siberia. A chunky large-billed corn bunting is clinging on in the fierce winds as this once widespread species itself clings on in reserves like Frampton. Changing farm practices have greatly reduced food availability for this little bird. Whew, it's a relief to head out of the wind into the shelter of a hide. Beautifully set up too to optimize viewing. These Canadians are everywhere. Oh, Toby spotted something. The scarce and secretive duck we've been searching for, a beautiful male gargany. Thanks, wild and wonderful Frampton Marsh. We're calling in at a very new reserve with a lovely expanse of fresh water created from an old cold mine, and we score our first good look at another fairly nondescript warbler, willow warbler. Then it's a long drive northwest to the beautiful old village of Rommelkirk in Teesdale, which will be our base for exploring the Pennines. We're greeted by church bells and song thrush. And next morning we drive through the lovely little Yorkshire villages, up into the glorious vistas of the Pennines with their scattered sheep, farmhouses and dry stone dikes. Snipe, perched in the open, instead of being accidentally flushed from cover. Amazing! Another warbler, male black cap. These moorland hills are home to both black and red grouse. Red grouse is endemic to Britain. It's an extremely fast flyer and is adept at a last minute swerve. So unfortunately for the bird, it's the most valued game bird in Europe for those whose idea of sport is to blast it out of the air. Red grouse are not bred in captivity and released like pheasants. So we can enjoy watching this family in its natural habitat. Off to look for a black grouse lek. Breeding redshanks often perch on posts in these hills. 
we've spotted a distant lek of 17 male black grouse. The polygamous males gather in spring on traditional arenas to display and fight. The females on the fringe mate with the dominant male, who after mating takes no further part in family life. A closer view of a male, with his grumbling call, strutting his stuff, and showing his spectacular display of tail feathers. Several other species breed in this upland moor environment. Golden plover. Curlew with its huge beak. Oh, it's blown its reputation for wariness and secrecy. The largest of the waders its haunting flight call is evocative of this sweeping, lonely habitat. We're setting out to find the rockier habitat favoured by ring oozel, passing a herd of belted galloways and encountering breeding lapwings, which are noisily protective of their chicks. These rocky slopes look promising for oozel, and wheat ears like them too. Perfect dipper habitat. We're on the lookout. A nesting pair of oyster catchers, noisily protesting our presence, and stock dove, sheltering quietly out of the wind. Ah, Toby spotted oozel. The upland counterpart of blackbird, but much rarer. What a lovely thrush. Down into the valley and into Deepdale Wood, looking for nuthatch. It's here, but too high to film. Much easier to see in a meadow on the way out, grey partridge. The only English partridge is now much rarer than the introduced red-legged partridge. Cuckoo is calling. The River Tees tumbles down at High Force Waterfall and there is plenty of wildlife along the river banks. Of the three pipits found in Britain, meadow pipit is the most common. This shallow, tumbling, rock-strewn water is the preferred habitat for several species. The ubiquitous common sandpiper with its constantly bobbing tail The boldly contrasting black and white of male pied wagtail. Dipper at last, one of our favourite birds and very specific to this habitat, hopping along the rocks and sometimes plunging into the fast flowing water to feed. and the confusingly named grey wagtail. The male especially always looks more yellow than grey to me. Next morning, we head over the Pennines, leaving behind the beautiful Yorkshire Dales. We're heading northeast to sea houses on the coast of Northumberland. This is the embarkation point for a boat trip to the Farne Islands, and we're pretty excited about it. Owned and protected by the British Trust, these islands host 100,000 pairs of breeding seabirds, including over 23 species, as well as a large grey seal colony. The islands are enticingly white with bird droppings. We're lucky. Despite a ferocious wind, the trip is on. And as we approach, we start to see swimming birds. Mm -hmm. 
Amusingly, these seals don't want to get splashed. Then a big moment, our first puffin, an abundant summer visitor but seen only in these offshore breeding colonies where they nest on the coastal cliffs. The noise of thousands of birds is incredible as we disembark and brave the climb past the nesting arctic terns. Wear a hat, they'll swoop to protect their young. The very similar common tern is distinguished by a black-tipped bill in summer and is less numerous. The puffins' nests are burrows on the grassy slopes. All members of the Orc family except one are colonial nesters. Puffins coming in from the sea with a beak full of small fish for their young are mobbed by waiting black-headed gulls, trying to make them drop their catch. It's a fraught run to get into their burrows safely with their catch intact. These burrows, excavated by the birds, are one to two metres long and are often used again in other years. After feeding their chicks, there's time to loaf around to recuperate before heading out to sea again. Thousands of seabirds nest on the cliff edges. In the Guillemot colony, space is at a premium. Shags spend most of their time at sea, so it's wonderful to have this close view of feeding. Kittiwakes too spend their entire life at sea, except for breeding. Another orc, Razorbill, which like all orcs can fly underwater as well as in the air. But we can't resist spending more time with the puffins. Their nickname, Sea Parrot, comes from their huge, laterally flattened, blue, yellow and red striped bill, which is notched so that they can dive in open mouth down to 60 metres, not losing their catch and holding up to 10 fish at a time. Yep, we're pretty thrilled to see these wonderful little birds. And reluctant to depart from this special place. Pass the female eider duck on her nest, while other eiders, including males, are on the water. Pass the black-headed gull with her chicks, close enough to see that her head is really chocolate brown rather than black in colour. This is the commonest and most widespread gull in Britain. And regretfully, with no time to explore this island's fascinating history, going back to St Cuthbert in the 7th century, because now we're on our way north again. Crossing the border into Scotland, and what a surprise, it's raining. We're spending our last night in Musselburgh on the coast of the Firth of Forth, hoping for another chance for more seabirds. No surprise that oyster catchers gather in droves at Musselburgh. And the knots are finding plenty to eat too. A close view of the largest British tern, the lively and noisy sandwich tern, in breeding plumage. What a trip. Rainbow weather and fabulous birds in a country that really cares for its birds. Mm -hmm.